tomatoes. When it comes to variety, the options are endless. There are so many different varieties out there, and a lot of people often get overwhelmed because there are so many different names, phrases, and types of tomatoes that, honestly, I could see how it kind of gets overwhelming. And so in today's episode, we're gonna break all of those down so you understand what you're looking at, the names that are being used, and if you're looking for something in particular, you know what to search for. So with that, let's go. So when it comes to tomatoes, there are three main types of tomato. You have a determinate tomato, an indeterminate tomato, and a semi-determinate tomato. That is based on how the tomato grows and fruits. Everything else that I'm gonna mention will fall into those three main categories. A determinant is a tomato that has a determined height and a determined fruit yield. Everything will happen all at once. The tomato will grow, it'll stop growing, and it typically is gonna be a very bushy plant. On that plant, you're gonna have a set amount of fruit, and those fruit will all ripen at the same time. This is great for things like canning, because if you're canning, you don't wanna can one tomato at a time, you want a whole bush of tomatoes to can at once. And so this is really wonderful for that. It's also great for containers, because it's gonna be more compact and a little bit more, you know, just contained, so you have less to stake and less to support. Then you have semi-determinate, and that is really similar to, uh, to determinate, only the fruit will ripen at different times. It's not all gonna ripen at the same time. The height of the plant is still gonna be compact, it will still be bushy in size, and the fruit that forms on the plant is still determined, but you may get some in early July, some in mid-August, and the rest in late September. Those are going to be your semi-determinants. Everything is determined except for the ripening time. And then finally you have the indeterminate. And this is basically a tomato that will continue to grow all season long. It'll continue to fruit all season long, and the fruit will ripen at different times. These are usually your longest or your tallest plants. They're usually the most out of control if you can't stake them properly. And if you don't, uh, if you don't actually want all your tomatoes to come at once, it's a great thing. So if you're someone that wants a, you know, one tomato a week, it's awesome for that. You're gonna get one, two tomatoes every week well until the first frost. And as long as you can keep that tomato healthy and frost free, you'll keep getting tomatoes. So now that we looked at the three main categories of tomatoes, we're now gonna break that down into the next eight groups of tomatoes. These are groups that are basically gonna fit into those three categories. So essentially what we've done is we looked at the growth habit and the overall fruit ripening habit of a tomato plant, and then we're gonna break that down even smaller into the shape, size, and different characteristics that the fruit exhibits. This only has to do with the fruit itself, not the plant. So whether it's a semi-determinant, an indeterminant, or a determinant, that is going to be how the plant grows and how the fruit ripens. Once you actually have a ripe fruit, that is what then decides the category of tomato. We're gonna to start with the smallest and end with the biggest. There are eight different categories of tomato. And the first one we have is the current tomato. Now in the case of this Tess's Land Race current here, this is a small, almost known as a micro tomato. Now generally these are gonna be called a current tomato because they are very, very small, like the current fruit. Now, these are gonna be your smallest tomato, and they're typically considered a land race variety of currant, meaning that they're a little more closely related to the wild strains of tomato. These tomatoes are gonna be small, very, uh, very high in number, there's gonna be a ton of them per cluster, and generally, they're gonna ripen all at different times because they're, again, a little more wild, a little less domesticated. They have the most tomato flavor out of any tomato you're gonna find, but generally because they're smaller, the skin have, uh, can have a tendency to be a little bit thicker. But if you can put up with that or you like that, these are awesome. But they are a very, very small tomato, and they have usually a pretty high percentage of seeds to overall meat ratio. So it can tend to be a little bit seedier, a little bit thicker skin, but the flavor is awesome. Generally what I use these for is I'll throw these into a sauce to add flavor, but because I'm taking the seeds and the skin out when I mill them, you get the flavor and none of the skin and the seeds, so it's great to add really good body to like a sauce or a paste. Next is your cherry tomato. These are ubiquitous with snacking tomatoes. If you've ever had like a veggie tray or if you've ever had like a salad and you see the little round tomatoes, well, they look like cherries and that's where they get their name. They're cherry tomato. Now these are gonna have because we're kind of going smallest to largest, these are gonna have slightly more kind of juice or meat to them than a current tomato. If a current tomato is maybe a quarter inch in size, 
these are gonna be anywhere from like a half inch to one inch in diameter. So they're gonna go from maybe the size of my pinky nail all the way up to maybe like a quarter, right? So quite a lot larger of a jump, but still pretty small. They don't typically exceed one ounce. That's typically what kind of is the cutoff point for a cherry tomato. A cherry tomato that is less, or a tomato that is less than one ounce is typically considered a cherry tomato. They are also round like a cherry. Because as we'll get into, there are other tomatoes that have different classifications that are not round, but have a different name. Up next is this tomato right here. Now, this looks very similar to a cherry tomato, only it kind of has a weird shape to it. Some would say almost pear-shaped. That's <laughs> because this is a pear tomato. And pear tomatoes are still going to be one ounce or less. So very much the same as a cherry tomato. The only differentiating factor is the fact that it looks like a pear. Obviously, if you're looking for a little shape change or uh, textural difference in your salads or something like that, they're great. They're gonna have the exact same texture, flavor, color profile that all your cherry tomatoes are gonna have. You can find pear tomatoes that are black, yellow, red, cream colored, all the same colors. Really the biggest difference is just their shape, but they are awesome. Up next, we're getting a little bit bigger yet. This is the grape tomato. Now a grape tomato is one step above a cherry. What classifies a grape tomato is its elongated shape. There's no little pear top to them, so they're not a pear tomato, but they're smaller than two ounces. So the window for this, which makes this a grape tomato, is that it is one to two ounces. Anything less than that would be considered still a cherry tomato. And the fact that it's elongated makes it a grape tomato. And so because it has that unique shape and that weight characteristic, Anytime you see that, you're gonna typically find that to be a grape tomato. Now this variety is known as moonbeam moon bean grape, really low acid, super sweet. And honestly, this is probably one of my more favorite varieties of grape tomato. We also carry another one called supernova grape tomato, really awesome as well, but they are just so great in salads. Um, a hybrid that a lot of you have come to know and love is known as Juliet. A Juliet grape tomato really took the world by storm. It actually was one of the first grape tomatoes to be made kind of supermarket available, right? So like commercially available. And a lot of people really fell in love with it just because it had a thicker skin, almost like a normal tomato, still with all that incredible tomato flavor of a cherry, which is a little bit larger and a little bit more kind of heft to it. So that's the classification for a grape tomato. Up next, we're getting a little bit bigger yet. This is the plum tomato. Now the plum tomato really confuses a lot of people because they often classify this as either a large grape, which it's not, or a small paste, which it's not. It's its own group, it's a plum tomato. In fact, you can actually go to the store and find whole peeled plum tomatoes. It's a real category. There's not as many tomatoes that fit into this category though. There's not that many tomatoes because most tomatoes are either going to be either a grape or a paste, but what makes a plum tomato unique is the fact that it has a lot of the characteristics, the flavor, that pop of flavor, the yield that comes from your, your cherries and your grapes. So it's high yielding, but it also has low water content. And that low moisture content makes it awesome for things like making into sauce, pizza sauce, spaghetti sauce, um, but also even canning tomatoes, right? You don't want all that water in there because that water means you have to process it more. You have to boil that water off. And that extra processing time can destroy flavor, can take a lot of time, and ultimately, it really results in having you have to, um, to process a tomato longer than you would normally if you just picked the right variety. All right, now we're gonna get even more familiar. We're gonna talk about paste tomatoes. Now, paste tomatoes are often confused with making tomato paste. I wanna make a real clear distinction here before we talk about paste tomatoes because paste tomatoes are intended for making tomato paste. But anytime someone makes a tomato paste, they'll say, well, I can make tomato paste with like a plum tomato or I can make tomato paste with a, you know, a beefsteak tomato or even cherry tomatoes. Just because people make paste with those tomatoes doesn't mean that they, you know, that they should or that they're wrong. It's just there's a specific use for paste tomatoes. And hence, it's making paste, right? And so the idea behind paste is that there's very low moisture. And that's what you're going to find with a paste tomato. Now, paste tomatoes like this San Marzano have been used for centuries because what they do is they grow a very dry tomato that has almost no moisture in it, very little gel. And when they take these paste tomatoes, once they process them, it requires very little additional processing. 
Also, what's great is the fact that they yield a lot. These are going to be size comparison compared to a plum tomato. A paste tomato like this San Marzano is going to be about three to five inches in length and roughly weighing about three to five ounces in weight. So they're a heavier tomato than a plum, they're a larger tomato than a plum, and they're slightly drier than a plum. And that really brings a huge contentious issue because you'll hear people say, well, what about aroma? Like aroma is a paste tomato. Aroma is not a paste tomato. Aroma is a plum tomato. Aroma by all accounts is only about two to three inches in length. It only weighs about one to two ounces in, in weight. Sometimes you can get up to that three, that three ounce threshold, but there are more characteristics of plum tomato in a Roma than there are a paste. So just the more you know, is it gonna be earth shattering to you? I mean, maybe, but if you happen to make spaghetti sauce with Roma tomatoes, you're probably not gonna change much, right? It's just, you're still gonna call them a paste tomato and that's fine. I just want you to know the differences between these because often they can help us not only learn something, but it can also help us shop for other varieties that fall into that category and get what we're looking for. All right, we're getting even bigger. This is a slicer tomato. Now a slicer tomato is a high moisture content tomato. Usually it's going to be between five to eight ounces. Five to eight ounces with a high moisture content. What you'll notice with slicing tomatoes is that when you cut through them, you're gonna find much like a grapefruit or an orange, there's gonna be sections. And if you've ever sliced a tomato and you see those little pie wedges, those little pie wedges that look kind of like if you slice an orange open, you see those little wedges, right? Those are the segments of a tomato. And that's, that's what really dictates a slicing tomato. These tomatoes are gonna be great for throwing onto burgers or salads for fresh eating. They don't make a great sauce because of the fact they're so high in moisture. It's gonna require a lot of processing. They also are gonna yield less than like your plum tomatoes, your paste tomatoes, far less than your cherry tomatoes. So as you get bigger, the yield decreases and that's because there's more energy required to produce these tomatoes. Again, you're gonna find, just like all these other tomatoes I've mentioned, some are gonna be determinate, some are gonna be indeterminate, some are gonna be semi-determinate. You just need to do your research and kind of hone in on what you're looking for because if you realize you want, like this here, this is a Paul Robison tomato, absolutely incredible, dark kind of, uh, kind of burgundy colored tomato, super low acid with kind of some pineapple smoky notes, awesome flavor by the way. But this variety right here is indeterminate. You can find a slicing tomato that is also determinate. So just kind of based on what you're looking for, and that again, kind of goes back to what I just said with, you, you should know these terms because it opens such a world of possibilities to hone in on those specific varieties that are gonna do best in your garden and best for your lifestyle. All right, last but not least, the king of the garden, the beefsteak tomato. Now these are kind of what I consider to be the gold standard for your big meaty tomatoes. People say, I'm looking for a big meaty tomato. They're generally looking for a beefsteak. Now, that's not to be confused with the beefsteak type of tomato. There's literally a name of beefsteak, right? But there's also a whole variety of beefsteak. This right here is a giant Belgium. It's a beefsteak. There could be a variety like a pink brandy wine. It's a beefsteak. Mortgage lifter. It's a beefsteak. Beefsteak is any tomato that's going to be eight ounces all the way up to two pounds. There's much less water content though. They're a little bit drier, a lot more meaty, like if you're cutting into a steak, right? But also far less seeds. You're gonna have way more seeds in a slicer tomato than you will a beefsteak tomato. And like I just said, yield, the plants are gonna yield much less than a slicer tomato. And that's because they get that much bigger. Also, beefsteaks are a lot more prone to things called cat facing. That's where tomato uh, blossoms will bloom you'll have kind of like a mutation where two blooms will bloom exactly at the same time and they'll fuse together. And that's where you get those gnarly lobes or the bumps, things that people kind of look for in an heirloom tomato, it gives it some character. You're gonna see that a lot more frequently in beef steaks than you will like slicing tomatoes. Final thing I'll mention too, is that beef steaks can also be found in the determinant, indeterminate and semi-determinant categories. You just gotta do your research. When it comes to beef steaks, the skin is gonna be slightly thinner, maybe a little bit more prone to cracking, but ultimately, this is as big as you're gonna get. And those are all eight categories of tomatoes. It doesn't matter if you're looking for, like I said, a black tomato, 
uh, you know, red tomato, yellow tomato, orange tomato, striped tomato, green tomato. There's so many different colors that then fall into those categories. So you could find a semi-determinate green slicer tomato. You could find a determinate red paste tomato. You could find what you're looking for. And so then, then that opens up all these amazing possibilities. But it's really important you know what you're looking for and why you're looking for it. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you all learned something new. I hope that this helped answer some of your questions you've got. If it did help, let me know in the comments box down below. Also, let me know some of your favorite tomato varieties. I really wanna know what you're growing, what you're liking. And also, shameless plug, if you're looking at getting tomato varieties, MI Gardener probably has the largest selection of tomatoes out there. There's probably something out there for you. So make sure you go check out migardener.com. We have, I think, over 120, maybe even 130 varieties of tomatoes. It's crazy how many we got. So go check that out. Link's in the description. And as always, we'll catch you guys later. Grow bigger. Bye.